faces. We do love seeing them, even if you don't look your best. It is uh, wonderful to see everyone here. I'm hoping James will show himself. All right, well, I need an umze, and as I cannot find James to request that of him, do I have a volunteer among refuge students to be the umze today? Karen? All right, Karen, I will present. Um, I'm going to go silent as I get Lama set up with Brown. Uh, you will see his presence, but he is not yet here yet. So give me a few minutes. My earbud fell right out, out right then. Are you doing it, Karen? That must have been a karmic thing. Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay, just checking.
Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Karen? Sham <laughs> Jesus,大主，比真知老不舍，谁诉说？Guru，Pema，Sidi，Om，Om，Organ，Yogi，Nobjangsham。Pema ge sardang pola Yashin shogi no drugne Pema june jesu drag Kordu kadro mang pukor Keki Jesu Dab Drupi Jinji Lobsher Sheksu So Guru Pema Siddhi Ho Hong Organ Yogi Nob Jang Sham Pema ge sardang pola Yashin shogi nob drubne Pema june jesu drag Kordu kadro mang pokor Keki jesu dab drupi Jinji lop shir shek su so Guru pema siddhi ho Teacher, foe destroyer Thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, Fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, 
To you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path while abiding in the pure trainings, Holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, May I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create, by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. <laughs> I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, 
I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam Guru Radnam and Dalakam Niyadiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Sharputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharadvadiputra. Sharadputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Kayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgati Bodhisoha. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, 
Parasamgate Bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Mahasattva Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. We're not doing a request for teachings. <laughs> All right, just do that. That's good. We'll get into that. How about we'll, we'll see if it's still there? Is it still there? Yeah. yeah. We'll do that. It's nice to have that. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Welcome today. Um, we're continuing uh, to talk about, investigate the 12 links of dependent origination. <clears throat> uh, uh, Run number four. <laughs> I hope you're still interested in this topic. Okay. Uh, this presentation um, of the 12 links is uh, from the standpoint of how things appear to us when we're uh, still uh, enmeshed in samsara like that. Um, Connor is adjusting my so how do I look? Okay. All right. So, so uh, this would be um, regarded as a provisional teaching. In other words, a teaching that requires interpretation rather than, uh, and uh, is uh, still talking about uh, relative or conventional reality rather than uh, definitive teaching, <clears throat> which is uh, kind of like just saying it just as it is. So depending upon uh, what kind of um, tenant or a school you like to follow, a uh, 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 heart sutra might be a definitive teaching um, or might be provisional. And the Mahayana Tara Tantra Shastra, third turn of the wheel might be the uh, definitive teaching, or it might be, um, uh, you know, interpretive. So uh, the people in the Buddhist studies program, uh, when you do your essay, I'll be asking you, um, is this a provisional teaching that needs interpretation, the uh, Uttara Tantra Shastra, Buddha nature, uh, or is it uh, a definitive uh, teaching? So, um, these kind of uh, questions and debates are um, academic to a point, but it, it makes a difference actually um, in our daily life, uh, in our training, in our performance, daily life I call performance. So um, we need to know what's uh, absolutely true and we need to know what's relatively true. Um, <clears throat> We need to know it's relatively true because uh, when it's relative, uh, it means that uh, it may change. It may be relative to circumstances. Uh, it may be produced. Whereas uh, absolute truth uh, would be hopefully true in all circumstances and uh, not produced. Those are some examples. 
<clears throat> but uh, the 12 links uh, is uh, an attempt to uh, talk about uh, how things uh, are created and experienced when we're uh, enmeshed in our delusion, so to speak. <clears throat> uh, the idea of giving the teachings is still uh, uh, skillful because it's meant to uh, help us develop uh, what's called uh, definite emergence um, in Tibetan Nejong, which uh, sometimes uh, is translated as renunciation. Um, renunciation, uh, sometimes it feels like a good word, um, feels kind of biblical, uh, a little bit um, uh, biblical that way. So it has some uh, maybe uh, misleading parts to it. Um, but some translators like using uh, biblical words. So sometimes uh, some of the uh, karmic um, missteps we make have seen translated as sins. Um, sometimes we talk about the evil realms. Um, uh, Robert Thurman, a distinguished translator in the Tibetan Book of the Dead translates uh, Dakini as angels. Um, mm, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, maybe it works for it, it works for Bob, you know. So uh, when we're using language, um, we have to understand that uh, language uh, can be relative to time and place, particularly when we're dealing with translations. So uh, uh, the 12 links of dependent origination are sometimes translated slightly differently and probably will be translated uh, differently maybe in uh, 25 years, something like that. <clears throat> but the idea of the links is that it is a chain that can be broken. So uh, this is not a heavy duty chain um, that cannot be broken. It's uh, more like a chain that we believe is heavy duty, but is actually um, just a chain uh, that has maybe a little coating of gold over it. And you know we're, we're buying it at Walmart. We don't know that it can be uh, broken. <clears throat> so name and form is a, a pattern that uh, appears after uh, consciousness. And uh, this is gonna be a little bit technical, I guess, but uh, name and form um, in the 12 links is the beginning of the uh, birth, uh, is the uh, actually pre-birth, it would be corresponding to our life uh, as an embryo, uh, our life in the room like that. <clears throat> because name and form usually corresponds to uh, the five skandhas or heaps. So this is how the heaps and skandhas is how uh, the Buddha described uh, what we are, um, we're heaps. <laughs> Would you like a different translation? <laughs> so you can call yourself skandhas, I don't know, collections, um, we're just a collection. Um, uh, so, Maybe heaps is a good translation. So the idea is like we're a collection, but we're not even like a super organized collection. It would be like, like instead of hanging up our clothes, we just drop them in heaps like that on the floor. You know, my jeans are over here somewhere. I think it's that heap. No, over there is the, um, you know, that's the cat food over there. And you know, you know. so I think the emphasis with, um, uh, the Buddha describing people this way is to really break down the idea that um, there's a centralizing entity that runs things. There's uh, a big part of uh, all of the Buddhist teaching is saying there's no Atman, there's no uh, central uh, ruler of uh, our experience. It's not a permanent central ruler. Um, it's a, a 
uh, when we're confused, it's an organized mess. Um, and when we're uh, uh, on the path, it becomes more and more organized and eventually becomes an enlightened mandala. So <clears throat> maybe heaps is uh, a good uh, translation for um, how it feels when we're uh, under stress and confused. Because usually people will just say, you know, I'm a big mess. <laughs> so uh, we Dharma people, we just admit it. Actually, we're just a big mess all the time. Kind of uh, 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 existing in, in piles that uh, somehow uh, relate with each other, that um, we're kind of a mess. So that's um, what we're talking about in name and form. So the, the personality, the human being is broken down into like physical form, which is what we can see, what has uh, extension, so to speak, and, and uh, delineation. And then the other, uh, so we say rupa means like body, like that. And then the other four skandhas are all mind. So usually second one, Vedna is like, uh, you know, feeling, and then there's perception, and then there's what's called formations, which are basically emotions, and then there's consciousness, which we talked about last time. So unlike Western psychology or normal Western talking, um, the mind is not just our, you know, cognitions, not just our thoughts, not just our narrative but it's anything uh, that has to do with knowing or feeling or um, experiencing. So uh, when we say realize the nature of mind, um, we're not just saying realize uh, how you're thinking, we're, we're talking about all of our lived experience like that. So that's an important piece is that uh, in Buddha Dharma mind, uh, covers sensations, it covers feelings, it covers emotions, it covers energy, it covers thoughts, it covers knowing, it covers awareness, it covers primordial um, insight. Uh, that's all you know, under uh, mind, because the idea is that all these uh, activities, all these functions have the ability to know and to um, discriminate and um, to be aware. <clears throat> so, uh, in Buddhist ideas, uh, thoughts and emotions, heart and head, are not uh, uh, different entities. Uh, they're all on the level playing field, like that. So, uh, sensations, like which are on the most basic level, pleasurable or unpleasurable or neutral and uh, or feelings and then perceptions like the ability you know, to say that's blue or that's red and emotions like love and hate and desire and consciousness which can distinguish uh, things and no things uh, that's all uh, a level playing field uh, that's all uh, functions of mind <clears throat> Or I think usually Western psychology, it's like when people are saying my mind, they're, they're thinking just about their thoughts or their, um, their self that perceives things and um, their sensations and their emotions are, are different. So uh, I'd like to have a little discussion of that in a few minutes, whether that makes sense to people. <clears throat> the 12 links, um, is, as I said, a description of how things are experienced um, uh, when we're stuck in delusion, when we don't see things as they are. <clears throat> and some people have uh, described them as um, like a little bit depressing because it uh, covers everything, right? So uh, we have birth and old age and death and um, becoming and grasping and uh it's kind of a, it's a little bit depressing don't you think and it starts with ignorance <clears throat> uh it's meant to be depressing so that you want to uh 
escape it or clarify it or uh, realize that um, it's delusional. So the 12 links in my mind are a little bit like describing the process of addiction or uh, the process of um, uh, any system that uh, goes haywire or that has a problem. So it's describing a dysfunctional system, to use those kinds of um, psychology words. So for example, if someone uh, has a, a meth addiction, um, they're living in uh, a world that corresponds very much to uh, this typology of the 12 links, this uh, craving, this grasping, this ignorance, and then the uh, satisfaction, and then it starts all over again. So uh, when people are working with addicts, they have to describe uh, the current situation when someone's using as really being uh, unmanageable and intolerable. Otherwise, uh, people uh, don't make a change. So when I'm working with addicts, many times they'll say, yeah, I know that was bad. Uh, my life as an addict is bad uh, because it makes me do things I don't want to do. But parts parts are really good, you know, uh, and I'm not doing it all the time or um, uh, lots of things are working out. Um, but yet, uh, if you trace their lives, generally it's it's a gradual downward slope. So yes, we are enjoying ourselves uh, as we uh, de-evolve as our dysfunction becomes heavier. And when we're in an addiction, whether it's a physical addiction or a thought addiction, we generally uh, are in what's called denial, which would be the Buddhist idea of ignorance. In other words, we, we think we're kind of doing fine. We know we have some real lapses and yeah, maybe we have a few DUIs or maybe we've spent a little time in jail or maybe we've gone bankrupt, but you know, it's all pretty good. But uh, in addictions work, just like 12 links, uh, a llama or a therapist or a friend is gonna say, you know, actually your whole life is pervaded by this denial and these problems. It looks like you're escaping through temporarily um, having a good time or temporarily no negative effects, or you, maybe you still have your job, but uh, the overall system is going down and the overall system is uh, pervaded by uh, problems. So for someone to really get into recovery, they, uh, they have to, in some sense, be willing to entertain this idea that their whole life has to take a new direction and has to change. So uh, it's very close to a Buddhist idea that uh, people need to listen to the teachings to the point where they go, you know what, I, I need to make really a fundamental change, not just a um, surface change, not just a um, uh, level one change, but I need to change my paradigm. So the, the 12 links are meant to be uh, an activating um, call for people to go, oh, wow, no one's told it like that before. I see that not only is this life going to be suffering, but the next life's going to be suffering too. So this is where we have, have what I might call sacred dharma or religious Buddhism because, uh, you know, science has improved um, future lives or past lives at this point. Maybe they will. I like science. But uh, uh, a big part of Dharma is convincing people that um, your life is not over uh, when uh, your physical form uh, starts to disintegrate, uh, that uh, one's mind stream uh, carries on. <clears throat> so uh, the renunciation or the definite emergence uh, is not just from this life, but uh, the possibility, in fact, the inevitability that uh, we do it all over again unless we uh, wake up. So the idea is to bring about a change uh, so that people go, I, you know, I, I want to I stop it right now. I don't want to 
want to stop it now, today, um, not tomorrow or uh, when things get better like that, but I want to start uh, doing some training and practice and wake up right now. So it's meant to be um, very vivid and um, uh, very uh, uh, dysfunctional in, in its feeling. It's not um, meant to be literal like um, a time cause and effect thing, you know, like uh, high school chemistry or something. It's meant to describe a whole dysfunctional system. So many times people develop uh, substance abuse issues because they come from a family that was uh, using an alcoholic system. But uh, we couldn't say there's a directly correspondence, you know, like uh, to that, um, because um, uh, it's not happening in, in that kind of way, like uh, physical billiard balls hitting each other. But uh, generally, the cause and conditions for someone to uh, become addicted are going to exist in the environment. And trauma is going to help cause addictive issues, even though trauma may not look like it's a direct cause or be um, telling you to walk down the liquor aisle or something. So uh, the 12 links, sometimes people say, well, it just seems to skip around. Like all of a sudden we're talking about rebirth where it feels like it's something internal. Well, the reason for that is we're trying to show that uh, this is a, a totally dysfunctional system when it's run by ignorance and craving. So uh, we want you to uh, uh, wake up uh, and be compassionate so that uh, you're out of this uh, circular um, uh, system called samsara. It's um, a useful uh, uh, typology uh, for art and uh, generally every temple just like ours or monastery has a large painting of the wheel of life that's um, being held by the demon Yama, uh, the lord of the underworld. And um, it has six realms in it. And uh, people's style of dysfunction, style of suffering, style of samsara um, is classically um, portrayed in, in six different ways. So the different realms uh, are uh, some of uh, the uh, Buddhist idea of a DSM-5, something like that. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, stop here and see if I'm making sense um, and see if there's some questions. Uh, or comments or complaints from our Dharma audience. Yeah, good. Hi, hi, Dan. Good morning, Lama. Thank you for this teaching. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> um, I had a question about um, this that really kind of stoked a fire in my mind. Um, mm -hmm when you're talking about addiction, mm -hmm. there's different models of treatment of addiction. And one, of course, yeah. you know, the 12 step program, you know, it's a, a sickness and you have to get away completely from the triggers, the people, the behaviors, all of that, you know, it's a, it's something that you're powerless over. And then there's another movement in that called harm reduction model where mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to agree that I'm totally powerless. I'm, I'm going to agree that I got a real problem. And when I get into these situations, mm -hmm. my problem gets worse and worse. And it's kind of like a, a step into the belief that that path leads to problems. And my experience with working with people is they kind of fall in those two camps. I was wondering if you could take that concept of harm reduction and bring it into the sacred and the secular dharma as practices like what would be the difference right between completely going a hundred percent and versus going 75 80 percent what is what is the impact right <laughs> um 
Yeah, so of course, um, most most twelve steps are abstinence, right? Um, based. Uh, although I'd like to point out, it isn't that we're powerless in our lives; we're powerless over our addiction. So um, obviously, we uh, we have to take um, some intelligence and power to recognize we're addicted or seek help and and work the program, but. Um, the secular harm reduction model or rational recovery, um, I think is another skillful means. So uh, frankly, I try to work both ends of the street, you know, um, uh, Buddha Dharma is like, let, let's totally uh, eliminate misknowledge and falsity and let's totally wake up to our inherent joy and freedom uh, with no compromise and uh, while we're letting that sink in, we're going to do harm reduction. <laughs> so uh, in Buddha Dharma, you both have the uh, long run teachings, uh, stages of the path and the gradual approach. And then at the same time, you would have the immediate and, uh, uh, enlightenment approach like Mahamudra and Dzogchen. But Vajrayana Dharma is always a mix of uh, um, Maybe what Suzuki Roshi said, you're perfect just as you are, and you could use some improvement. That's well, kind of like that. So I, I think both models are really important. Again, it uh, it depends upon what really grabs someone and really activates them like that. So uh, that's a good question. I go back and forth with some people. Um, but uh, if you're doing harm reduction, uh, you're We're really trying to steer people still toward recovery rather than just kind of um, just maintenance. Um, but for a lot of people, as you know, like uh, they've really benefited from like methadone treatment and, um, you know, maintenance models like that. So I like both systems like that. <laughs> do I get to have it both ways? James, what do you think? Thank you. That That is an extremely helpful answer of seeing that as almost like a pair of scissors working together to cut. The <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good. That's a good metaphor. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank that's you. Right. Yeah. Good, yeah. <clears throat> hmm? Ah, OK. Hi. All right. It's Ellen. I had my hand up, but I can't hear Connor, so we have to guess as to whether it's our turn. Okay, that's a shout out to Connor to be loud, right? Or else please repeat what he says, Lama, because we can't hear him. On I don't here. know what he said. Oh, no way. okay, great. All right, enough of that. Um, you know, on the, <laughs> you talked about the six realms and I always thought of them as sort of hierarchical or levels, but <clears throat> today you described it in a way that really intrigued me. You said people have different styles and it sort of struck me like the Buddha families. And uh -huh. so I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what you were saying about the styles and the realms. It, do, do you sort of have a tendency to be a different temperament or do you, is it that you're in a different level or you behave in a different level and it has its own qualities? Um, uh, in a way, the best realm uh, is the human realm because uh, human beings are always uh, curious and trying to, um, you know, measure and see what's the best, you know, so uh, uh, and have the most fully developed senses in mind. Um, but in a way, we still want to uh, leave the human realm also. So. Uh, but usually the God realms on on the top, so to speak, which is uh, uh, great while it lasts, but then the God realm or the realm of ease falls apart. Um, general, generally, the hell realms, the Naraka realms, are are seen as uh, extremely difficult because the whole situation is pervaded by um, anger and hostility, whether it's hot or cold. Um, but 
um, they, they all entail lots of suffering like that. So you, you don't want to really hang out in any of the realms. It sounds funny not to hang out in the human realm, but um, interestingly, when the Buddha was asked, are you a god? He says, he said, no. And they said, are you a human being? He said, no, I'm, I'm awake. So there's something uh, kind of transhuman going on there. Not, not, will, not a kind of human being. We'll all be in the human realm until everybody's not, to some extent. Um, I, I'm not sure. Like, um, you can you you don't have to like, you, you you don't have to like get to the human realm to do dharma. You can do it in any realm. Because hmm. it's, you know, um, the majority of people I'm talking to, I, uh, I suspect, are looking like human beings. So you you probably will be in the human realm at the same time, although I have some very interesting um, uh, little medallions on the screen here, you know, but um, you, 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 you want to uh, uh, start where you are, as Pema Chodron says, so um, you don't want to wait and say, okay, I, I just want to get to be um, a functional human being and then I'll do the Dharma practice. You, you, you know, if you're really in a hell realm place or uh, just a warring place like this, sure is you, you want to you start practicing and investigating and training exactly where you are. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big one. <laughs> Karen? Um, Lama, it, my question is about the 12 links. I mean, I, I'm assuming that we want to exit um, <laughs> that cycle uh, in one of those links, but truly we can't. Is it true that we can't really exit this this cycle, this cycle of samsara and the twelve links, without realizing emptiness? Is that true? Uh, so, uh, you know, in in the Mahayana teachings, particularly, we we emphasize uh, emptiness, um, but. Uh, Emptiness has to be understood in a certain way. So um, when we say emptiness, uh, it, it means really understanding that nothing's uh, fixated, right? Because that's our problem where we, we get um, totally fixated on things. We get fixated on things and fixated on people and fixated on who we are. And um, that kind of fixation uh, creates all kind of uh, conflicts, right? and uh, misperceptions mm -hmm. um, so you know we we want to realize uh that uh those uh fixations as solid as they may seem uh can be um liberated so uh uh we, we can kind of unkink the garden hose right um but uh we also need a positive view that um uh emptiness doesn't mean uh, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing there, so uh, it, it has all the positive qualities of uh, clarity and uh, bliss and knowing and, and all the Buddha functions. Um, some schools, uh, like the Prasangika, Madhyamika, really, they just want you to get like, okay, just just drop the rock that's in recovery, just, just you know, the, the earth isn't flat, okay, just get that, and then, you know, then you'll be okay, right? Um, so, uh, it's somewhat like you're working with, um, a phobia, right? So, um, you know, some people, they just, they don't get how, um, airplanes can fly, right? Cause it's heavy. So it doesn't make any sense. Right. So they won't get on an airplane, uh, even before COVID. Um, so, uh. On one level, you could say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the airplane is empty of not being able to fly, right? So 
you can watch airplanes and uh, you know and see it happening. But uh, and we can say how nice it is to fly. But also we can just eliminate the um, uh, delusion itself. Or if somebody believes the Earth is flat and they won't get on a boat or something, uh, we just said. You know, we don't have to tell you how great it is to travel, how nice it is to, you know, uh, just go around the world. Just just drop the idea that the Earth is flat, and uh, you can figure out your own travel plans. But like James's question, usually in Dharma, we're going to say, drop drop the delusion, and uh, when you drop the delusion, you'll you'll ha here's all the neat things you'll see when you travel. Some people are very motivated by. Uh, positive results. So they'll say, well, I, I'm really scared about traveling because the earth is flat, but you've described such a nice um, outcome. I I'm just going to try it. Um, other people are going to go, wow, you're right. I've listened to all the arguments and it, it doesn't make sense that the earth is flat. So, um, you know, even if I don't see anything interesting, I'm going to travel like that. So people have different personalities like that. But usually when we're saying just recognize uh, emptiness, we're, we want to recognize uh, the delusion. We want to recognize what's not there. That's the problem is we, we think something is there when it's not, and then we fail to see what is there. <laughs> right, right. <Yeah. laughs> uh, but sometimes people just say, wake up to the nature of mind or see, uh, see things directly see things as they are, or, you know, drop your attachment to, uh, or grasping it, uh, Atman, something like that. These are all getting at the same thing. Getting at the same thing in terms of, of liberation, yeah, changing liberation. how we see, how we see yeah. things and dropping the, yeah. the, yeah. uh, fixations of that we've created. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, um, uh, we we just have a hard time dropping things. Usually, <laughs> we, they just kind of have to wear out, you know. So, uh, you know, we possible? had this funny thing, you know. So the Buddha talked about like it's like somebody comes to me with a hot coal in their hand, and you know, says so my hand's burning, my hand's burning, and Shakyamuni just said, you know, just drop it, and then go. Well, I wanted to become cool. Then I'll drop it. You see, <laughs> that's that kind of model, you know. Yeah. So sometimes you have to do a harm reduction model with that person and say, okay, can I, can I pour a little cold water, you know, on, on your coal? And they go, oh, that's better. It still hurts like Elvin. That's better, you know. <laughs> so, but other times you just have to say, you know, drop the rock. But it's, you know, you, have, you just do this. But most of the time, um, we we kind of want our cake and eat it too. So uh, we we want to go the full length of suffering. We just want to get every little bit of suffering out of our experience before we kind of go. Well, that was a drag. I should have done that sooner. You know, it's just really weird how uh, most of the time we we want to just take it to the bitter end before we uh, let go. Mm. <laughs> so a lot of times. Uh, and the harm reduction model, bodhisattvas are kind of running after people, you know, saying, okay, can, I'll, you know, here's some, here's some burn salve for your hand. I, I know you won't drop the sucker, but, you know, use this like that. Sometimes that backfires because then, of course, people uh, keep up their delusion and keep up harming, you know. So uh, there's always a lot of debate about that, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, emptiness is, um, I don't know, you know, not, uh, it, it's a difficult word in English again, you know, so um, it's like the translation of Sanskrit, shunya, uh, which some translators have uh, translated as like hollow or overblown, you know, too puffed up, you know, so. You know, like when we say about somebody or something like they're just hot air, you know, they're just they're just, you know, they're just all shallow. You know, it's kind of empty. So uh, I, I don't know if it's always a good word. Sometimes we have to say full, 
or open or uh, interdependent or non-obstructed or um, something like that. <clears throat> Hi. Is that to me? This is Susan? Yeah. Okay. Um, you may have just already answered this. I'm not sure I followed entirely everything that you were saying. But if the best place to break the link, the chain, is in the links of grasping and um, craving, are you saying that those links are not really cut, the chain isn't really broken until the original, the first link, well, except it's round, it's not vertical, mm -hmm. um, but the link of ignorance, when that link is broken, then you can break the link of grasping and craving entirely and break the whole chain but you can't do it just at grasping and craving because you can't break grasping and craving without breaking ignorance. Is that what you were saying? Or I don't know. I'm anyway, does that make any sense? That's, slight, that's slightly different, you know, generally in order, it's like craving and then, you know, then, then you hold on to it. You don't want it. You don't want it to go when you're doing, uh, you know, uh, Trishna is craving. So, you really want something bad, but you haven't gotten it yet. And then, uh, you know, grasping is Ubadana, you, you, you've got it. But when it starts leaving, you start, you really kind of white knuckle, right? Um, so uh, in the development of the teachings of the Buddha and historically too, um, there's differences of opinion, right? Differences of emphasis. So in Theravada teachings, um, traditionally in, in, in America and the West or whatever, um, there's a lot of emphasis on um, letting go, right? <laughs> you just hear it over and over, letting go, letting go. So that's responding to uh, let go of the grasping and, the, and kind of uh, you know, break, break the fixation there. Um, uh, Mahayana traditions have generally criticized that be, as being incomplete. So it is possible to uh, soften or um, break some of the hold by uh, totally reducing the craving and the grasping, but uh, there's going to be uh, ignorance still there. So the Mahayana and Vajrayana teachings put uh, more of an emphasis on uh, uh, the knowing nature of mind, uh, primordial awareness, than they do on uh, uh, and the mistaken, the mistaken aspect of the craving and grasping rather than just the activity itself. So ignorance becomes the, the main problem from the Mahayana and Vajrayana point of view. So I, is, would it be true to say then that Arhats, Shirakas, Pradyeka Buddhas, who have supposedly broken the the links of, of grasping and craving um, haven't really broken the chain because they haven't realized that emptiness is that is that correct well that, that that's the view of, of some of the Mahayana schools generally but uh, in in other Mahayana schools like <laughs> we're getting a little like detail okay present geek uh, Madhumika is going to say uh, arhats and the self-realized Buddhas um, hearers uh, can realize emptiness, but they're not uh, fully able to uh, realize omniscience. <laughs> so that's because uh, Prasangika Madhumikans uh, generally talk about uh, emptiness uh, as an object somewhat, like an object and which could be a mind object is uh, is empty, you see, like that. 
So <clears throat> uh, they're going to say, yeah, the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas have the same uh, realization of emptiness as a, knowing something objectively, right? But they haven't developed uh, what, for the sake of argument, I call the subjective uh, knowing aspect, the nature of mind. So uh, the Mahayana and Vajrayana claim that uh, the Buddha's knowledge is much vaster, uh, knowing um, the true na nature of mind, and then knowing uh, all the paths of liberation and knowing um, past and future lives and all that. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't think there's actually been a double blind, <laughs> you know, random scientific thing, you know, like that. So some of it has to be, of course, uh, at times sectarian. And when we're talking about Travakas and Pratika Buddhas and Tantrikas and Bodhisattvas and Buddhas, um, we have to be careful that we may not be talking about um, actual existing schools or people. We're talking more about um, attitudes and, and uh, awakenings. So um, like that. You know, styles of practice and um, uh, levels of practice like that. But uh, when we have an overview of Dharma, we can see that people are going to put on different emphasis on things. So definitely a Theravada point of view and the Vipassana, um, uh, Vipassana schools in America are always talking about letting go, right? You, you, can, you can read a lot of Vajrayana Dharma without hearing about letting go. So you're going to hear much more about um, uh, developing uh, awareness and resting in awareness, right? Like that in Mahamudra. But it still means letting go of delusions, right? So this letting go. <clears throat> maybe, is it all just words? <laughs> but maybe there is some correspondence between experience and words also. <clears throat> What's more attractive, letting go or uh, resting in the nature of mind? Which, which sounds better? Maybe if we have a coal in our hand, it sounds better. Maybe if we're on a nice cushion, our resting in the nature of mind sounds better. <laughs> like <that. clears throat> Generally, though, like in Vajrayana, um, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to overcome ignorance, and which means not knowing something, which also means knowing it the wrong way. So we could ask somebody, like, you know, what shape is the earth? And they go, I don't know. Um, and other people would go, it's flat. Um, uh, from Vajana point of view, misknowledge is more dangerous than not knowing. Because not knowing, you know, we could say, hey, do you want to know, you know, what the earth is shaped like? And we could go, yeah, I do. You know, and they go, spherical. And like, Great. But when you have misknowledge, it's harder to overcome. So I'm sure over the last year and with, um, lots of differences of opinions with politics and gun control um, and health issues. Uh, I'm sure everybody that's listening and in the room has kind of gone, I, I can't believe people are believing that, you know, or they're still voting for that person or whatever, you know, and uh, you know, th those kind of uh, fixations are, are what's very hard to work with. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. So I just had a, a picture of like an of like addiction in my head, or well, I guess like any kind of like uh focus of something. It's like you have a it's like it's just like this leaf on this tree and you're just like ah i don't i don't like that leaf that leaf shouldn't be there i'm gonna oh wait it's attached to this entire branch hold hold on i think i need to get ah the branch is the pro oh wait this is oh wait that's a stick attached to this bigger branch okay i'm gonna pop that 
okay, I connect to this trunk. Maybe I just cut down the tree. Now, now I can see the, oh wait, the root system is all over the place. And now I need to pull up these roots. And then you pull yeah. up the roots and you're like, wow, that tree was nuts. And then you walk away from the tree. You're like, oh, the tree is gone. And then you turn around and you're like, oh, look at that tree I pulled out of the ground. And it's still there. It's still, the, the concept of the tree is still laying there. It gets pulled away, but then you remember the tree. Okay, and the point is? It, it's that, like, <laughs> ignorance is fickle, and there's always more, it, like, it, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. It become more and more and more and more aware. And it's like, oh, I reached this thing. And then you find vastly more beyond that thing. And then once you you drop you drop the rock, you have the scar on your hand, and then you look at the scar and you remember the pain from the rock. And so it's still it's still there even in its absence. Yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely clear. Uh, uh, but that's probably not the Buddhist school we do. <laughs> because uh, uh, actually once, a, once uh, uh, we wake up, we're, we're not going to fall back into ignorance. So non-ignorance means you know, you're not leaving a trace like that. Mm -hmm. The hard part about uh, delusions or ignorance is that um, by the very nature of delusion, you can't find it as a separate delusion, you see. Yeah. So that's why Dharma is hard because uh, we, we have to like become convinced that uh, something isn't the case rather than finding. So you're not gonna find ignorance. You see, you're not gonna find a delusion. It's like you're not gonna find the flat earth and then negate it. So uh, with kind of the addiction model dropping the rock, um, there's, uh, there's nothing left. So there's liberation. What you're describing is kind of half, half, a little halfway it's uh, a relapse relapse i guess is what i'm looking at yeah that's kind of relapse yeah yeah so you're not really um yeah and uh you know that's a good point about relapse is uh you know a little we we there's still some hooks right some <laughs> little little hooks that tear us back so we we want it to be um we we need to become fully convinced that uh, there's nothing wrong with us, you see. We'd like to believe there's something fundamentally wrong at the core, because it seems there should be, or he wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> right? So we act as if, weirdly, we act as if something is fundamentally wrong, mm -hmm. and therefore then we do create negative karma, but actually uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with us. So that's when people say, well, you know, okay, well, then I'll just stop meditating. <laughs> but we, you know, we actually have to become confident and stabilize that and then manifest it like that. But many people do Dharma practice for a long time and still deep down, they have a deep sense of brokenness and shame. And uh, that's what we're after in Dharma. So uh, we don't want to do an incomplete liberation where um, there's a ticking time bomb, you know, you have to go uh, and work on, uh, you know, our secret shame, so to speak. Hope that helps. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe time for one more comment or question. Complaint, let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we can't, um, 
<clears throat> we generally can't do it uh, totally by ourselves, even though we have to do it ourselves. So that's why we need mirrors, um, we need teachers and Sangha members. So uh, the mirror uh, can't do it for us, right? The mirror is not going to put on the makeup and shave, say how our hair is doing, right? But the mirror, uh, like the nature mind, can reflect and then we can take appropriate action. So that's always kind of the uh, interesting contradiction about doing real Dharma practices um, that we need help uh, and we have to do it ourselves like that. <laughs> So uh, the Buddhas do not um, transfer realizations or um, you know do magical things, just teach like that. So the idea is if we continue looking in the mirror, um, then uh, we will wake up like that. So it's very optimistic actually. The, um, the idea is to um, uh, you know wake up, benefit others and, and uh, have a good time, really enjoy our lives as much as we can, don't you think? So, uh, you know, uh, happy Easter, happy pagan, happy springtime, <laughs> happy Sunday uh, to everybody. So let's do prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chan Rezik Tenzin Gatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Welcome. Thank you, Karen. Welcome. Uh, um, I'd like to thank all the people that have been working on um, preparing the temple uh, Dana Darge to be painted. It's a big deal. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Connor and Paul uh, for working on the um, audiovisual uh, studio. I wish we could turn the camera around so you could see it. Uh, okay. <laughs> sure, why not? <clears throat> Yeah. Okay, good. Mm. Okay, yeah. So uh, just one other information is um, we're uh, hoping uh, for Sacramento County to be in what's called the orange level of uh, um, the pandemic uh, uh, so that we can, you know, have start meeting um, everybody uh, still being safe. 
Um, I still want to encourage people that uh, haven't been vaccinated that when it's available and um, uh, you can take it, do it. Um, there's always probability in science. There's never perfection, but I can't believe anybody now wouldn't uh, get a polio vaccine or a tetanus vaccine. So um, I look forward to uh, seeing you all. Probably you'll be uh, within a month, I'm hoping, um, but we'll let you know. Thanks for everyone's contributions. Ciao. Bye. Thank you, Lama. <laughs> Thank you, Lama. Yeah. Hi, Liz. Thank you, Lama. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's here. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Lama. I'm going to miss. Thank you. I'm going to miss this big screen. We're not going to have this forever. It's kind of fun saying goodbye to everybody. So. Bye, Lama. Thank you so much. Bye. For your Thank you, All Lama. right, Susan. I know your voice. I don't see your face, but I know that voice anywhere. So, uh... yes. <laughs> All right. Ciao.